this is, this is, this is. All right, Mike Valente, guitar player of Brick by Brick, hardcore, uh, hardcore band out of upstate New York. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me. So uh, how crazy. So tell me how you got started in the hardcore scene, because I know how I got started, but I want to know about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, originally, I was a metal kid. Um, you know, I grew up on stealing my dad's records, you know, the Judas Priest, Sabbath, Maiden, all that kind of things. And, uh, you know, got really, um, really involved with metal a lot. You know, I had, had the long flowing hair. I loved the thrash. I loved all, I didn't like any of the hair metal stuff, but, um, then my, my buddy, Chris, uh, used to sing for a band called Wolfpack, which was a hardcore band based out of Albany in the, in the eighties. He took me to my first hardcore show in 1985, and it was DRI and COC, and it just blew my mind. So that was like the first uh, experience I had with a hardcore show, and just seeing the the unity and the camaraderie from all the the kids at the show, and they, they you know, I didn't know anybody at the show except for my friend Chris, but he introduced me to people and. You know, they were just open arms, and, and that just kind of got the ball rolling right there. What is it about the hardcore scene that, that makes that true? Like, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, the community, the group, you know, what, why? I mean, what it, do you know why? I, I just think these kids are all, most of them have a common denominator. They're all, uh, I, I don't want to say misfits, but it, it's, the, the growing up, you, you have that, me personally growing up I was kind of an outcast I I wasn't in the sports I wasn't in any of that you know I like music so I think in your like teen years high school years at least when I was growing up it wasn't really the popular thing to do so I think these kids kind of have a common denominator and they go someplace where they're welcome and mm. I know nowadays just being seeing it on the outskirts kind of it's it's the same thing it's like we you know we we encourage the upstate music scene to bring new people and you know if, if there's a kid that comes to these shows that hasn't been to a show you know i mean i do most of the shows here i'll, I'll comp them their cover i'll welcome them you know whatever it, it's just anything to, to to bring them in and the scene up in upstate new york and new york hardcore they're they give back. They give back to everybody that puts in. And when I say that, it's like you, you don't see. I, I, I haven't seen as many benefits and and good causes and you know anything for you know that just to help further their community. Mm -hmm. And you know whether it's a you know a, a, for an individual that needs help for hospital bills or whether they do a. a you know, thing for pit bulls. I mean, you know, there's, there's pit bull rescues and, you know, it's all sorts of things. They, they, it's always a good cause behind everything. Right. You know, yeah. It's great to see. So you went to that first show, DRI, COC. What, you know, what happened after that? Oh, it blew my mind. I was just like, holy shit. And I was just, I, I, and this is stuff. It was underground. So I, I, I lived in a suburban community all the people that I talked to and hung out with, they didn't listen to that stuff. So when I started going to high school, Chris, Chris Lynch from Wolfpack, you know, he was a year or two ahead of me, but, um, I knew he played drums on my head, played guitar and we jammed a couple of times and we just, we got to know each other, but he wasn't from my immediate circle. So just broadening my horizon to a, a new friend, he opened all the doors up for this stuff. So I'm like, what else is there? He's like, Oh, you, have you ever heard of Slayer? Have you heard of Venom? Have you heard of Motorhead? Have you heard of this? And next thing you know, it's Agnostic Front and Madball. It's like, it just, it never stopped for like five years. It was just, there was a new band every week I was listening to. It was crazy. And just seeing all the music that was out there, I was, I loved it. It was amazing. And, you know, that was the first, I, that was my first year seeing Slayer too, it was 85. So I saw them on the <laughs> hello eights tour and oh let me tell you 
seeing him in a club with overkill opening. It was just, it was incredible. So just knowing that my friend, he liked hardcore, but he also liked metal. And he's like, Hey, I'm going to show you all these bands that cross both genres over. And I'm just like, Whoa, this stuff's not on the radio. How'd you find this stuff? It's like, Hey, you gotta, you know, and here we are. Amazing dude. Yeah. I remember kind of getting into hardcore bands cause I got into punk first and, uh, suicidal tendencies. They're kind of like, they had some metal stuff. I mean, I yeah. thought, you know, thrash punk kind of stuff. And then DRI, like you're talking about, um, but Henry Rollins, uh, he had that Rollins band, End of Silence. I think it's called yeah. End of Silence. It's slow. It's just like that kind of pushed me into like the hardcore scene. It's kind of a weird avenue to get into it. But I didn't even know that Henry, you know, when I heard Rollins band, I didn't know Black Flag, Rollins. Like I didn't understand all that. I was a little kid, you know. <laughs> but uh uh, some of my favorites, you know, out there, Sick of It All, Snapcase, uh, Gorilla Biscuits. And, and I'm a West Coast kid. I grew up in the Seattle area. And so this was just, to me, these bands could be the biggest band in the world. I have no idea. But you were like kind of in the heart of it. You're probably seeing a lot of these bands at local yeah. community centers and, and, you know, not even like full on venues, right? Like Right. I mean, DRI and, and um, COC was at a VFW, and I remember it was a $3 show. Mm -hmm. I remember looking, and DRI's set list went from the ceiling to the floor. There, there must have been 50 songs on there, and I'm like, oh, they're going to play 50. I mean, granted, they're all 30 seconds, and <laughs> seconds, but it was just it was just nuts. It was just something I never, I never dreamed I even existed at that time. It was... But yeah, so seeing them in VFWs, and then there was a, a club called the QE2, which held about maybe 150 people, but they would always stuff 200, 300 people in that place. And then we had uh, Saratoga Winners, which was a big venue. Uh, so we got the bigger bands coming through there. And I remember seeing it Agnostic Front and Sick of It All. I think it was, it was right when Roger got out of jail. Uh, I want to say 91 maybe, but that was just... It was it was insane. It was just crazy. Man, that that's a cool time to be to be kind of cutting your teeth in the hardcore scene. You you yeah, yeah I'm jealous. I'm jealous for sure. <laughs> well, I'm also dating myself, so I'm a little <laughs> older. So. That's but, all right. Uh, you know, you take advantage of where you're at. <laughs> so all the cool shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh how did you how did you get together with uh, Brick by Brick? Or were there a lot of bands that happened before Brick by Brick, you know, in your when I, when I was a kid, um, I played in a, a thrash band called Attica. And actually, the, the owner of Upstate Records, Mario, was the original bass player in Attica. So we had the thrash background. So I remember we played covers mostly. We did a lot of Slayer. We ended up doing like Anthrax and Metallica. And, you know, we kept it to the, the, the gritty metal stuff. And then, then um, Attica kind of evolved and went to got out of the garage and started doing club stuff. And then the lineup changed. Then we started doing a lot of Slayer and, you know, Motorhead and things like that, o along with originals. And then we started working on our own stuff and released a few CDs. The lineups for Attica kept changing, kept changing. It, it, it lasted for almost 10 years. And uh, we did a lot. We, we did some tours with, like, Propane and Overkill. We actually played with Slayer and testament and you know bands like that and then um after that it, I, I i ended up joining another band called the bruise brothers and it was at that time when that swing revival was coming through so i got a little burnout on the thrash you know playing guitar wise and a friend of mine tried to hey why don't we do this stuff and it was like half swing and half hardcore so we <laughs> It was it was like a cross between like uh, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy and Sick of It All. It was yeah. it was a crazy combination, and that landed lasted for a few years. The um, the singer of that band was the the quote unquote leader of the band, and the direction of the band was going more of a radio thing. And I lost interest in it, and we just kind of ended on a good note. And then I started Brick by Brick, and I was and at the time I I had my own club. And I was doing shows and I met like all the members of Brick by Brick who were 
members of the scene at the time. And I'm like, listen, I said, this is the stuff I like. I want to do like a mixture of, of Slayer meets hate breed, shaking hands with agnostic front and sick of it all. You know, something like that. Let's do something that's fun and keep it fun. And so we got that together and that lineup lasted almost a decade. We started in 2004. And, but the thing is we never toured. We never did anything because you know, the, the singer had a really weird schedule and the drummer worked too much. And so we didn't do a lot, but we had a couple of moments. We, we ended up getting a, a, on tour in 2014. We ended up getting on tour with Biohazard in Canada. And it was kind of our first tour after a decade. And we re- I realized I didn't really want to play with the singer anymore. And I'm like, ah, he wasn't really cut out for it. So at that time, Ray, who was in Full Blown Chaos, always told me, he's like, hey, he's like, if you ever need a backup singer or a fill-in, let me know. So I, I was on the phone with him when we were in Canada. I said, listen, we have a Madball tour offered to us in Canada as well. This kid's not going to make it. It's just, I, I want to kill him. You know, like, yeah, I'll do it. So, okay. So we came back from that tour, got in, you know, with Ray and did one rehearsal and went on that tour in the middle of the tour. I'm like, you just want to be in the band. <laughs> He's like, absolutely. And, you know, at that point it wasn't so much about our experience or how we were playing. It was more about just hanging out and it, it, it is to this day. And the lineup still is, is made a couple of changes but it's fun, and and we're at the point in our career where you know we're older, so we all got jobs. We all revolve our the band around family and and stuff like that, and and it's it works. And we we end up doing more than most, I guess, in our position. But it's fun. We keep it fun. Where it's not about the money. I, if it was about the money, I wouldn't be playing this stuff. I'll tell you that. But it's just it's fun. And Ray is is so such a down to earth dude. Our bass player, Andy is the most, he's just like such a, uh, everybody's just so easy going and half the, the, the half the experience is the ride in the van to the venue. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that we've almost crashed and died because I was laughing so hard. Here's my, I'm on a major highway. I can't see stop, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I think touring, like touring really, changes everything like if you if you're a band that's been a band a while and you haven't toured that that's one sort of experience and then as soon as you're on the road it's like a different thing you're you're smashed into the same vehicle as as a bunch of people you're spending day and night you're in stressful situations you're in fun situations you know all of the above right and if you don't like these people that's gonna be that's gonna be rough and and Obviously, I mean, there's over the years, a lot of bands break up, you know, because they just can't handle each other. So all good, all good. So you obviously kind of get it. Like, let's have some fun. Let's make this enjoyable. This is the whole point is to not hate our lives, right? Yeah. Um, what What about the business aspect of it that you seem to kind of naturally know how to promote shows, know how to put on shows? Like, did you just kind of watch? Did you have somebody like a mentor? Well, I mean, reason I, I started getting into shows was years ago because nobody would book our band, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, we, we try to get on shows, we try to get on shows, and like, well, you don't have a following to put on this show, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right. So we just started playing, you know, the VFWs. We started playing Backyards. We did all that stuff. And then next thing you know, we built up a little bit of a following, hooked up with a couple of people along the way that helped us. And next thing you know, all right, so now... Now, I still set up my shows going forward because I noticed that if you let a promoter get their hands in it, you don't get paid. And, and you know, in our area upstate, um, one of the bigger promoters, I helped him start. And next thing I know, you know, years later, I'm talking to all the people my age that played for him. I'm like, yeah, we never got paid. I never got paid. There was, nobody ever got paid. I'm like, well, that's funny because... Somebody got paid. I remember seeing hundreds and hundreds of people at these shows. Who the hell got paid? And you know what? So just learning from that. And I, I, I just said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it myself because 
I know how to, I'm in both aspects. I'm the promoter and I'm in a band. So I know how both need to be treated. I know how the venue needs to be treated. The promoter needs to be treated in the band. And I'm like, you know what? We got to make this fair for everybody. And I put, even when I do shows now, my books are open. I tell the bands, I go, you ever need, you ever got a question about where the money's going? I'll show you exactly my list of expenses. I'll show you exactly what the headliner's getting. Yeah. Oh, whatever. I say, I don't have a problem with that. It doesn't bother me. I mean, yes, I do pay myself. It's a very small percentage, but you know, if, if the band's getting paid a hundred bucks, I might get 25, you know? So, yeah. you know, and I tell them all that and you just got to be realistic. And the, the and, and Mario with the, with his record label has the same philosophy. It's like, just don't be a dick. I mean, how hard is it to not be a shitty human being? Yeah. It's not. And if you love this, you do it for the reason of the, for the music, not for your pocket. And I can't tell you how many, how much money I've lost over the years. I mean, it just, it happens. And if that, that's what you want to do, but you know what? I don't do drugs. I don't, I don't do anything really stupid with my life. So let's spend the money and, and have some fun, make, make it fun for other bands, give them the experiences or try to give them the experiences that I had. Yeah. Well, other bigger bands have had you know so i mean as far as a business aspect i mean right now i have the best of both worlds i i i pretty much hit the um the mother load uh the big um venue up here used to be called upstate concert hall and what they did is they called me and asked me to partner up with them so we opened up a new venue in albany called empire so we have empire live which is a thousand cap room upstairs and then empire underground which is a a 350 cap room so now the benefit is i don't have to worry about coming out of pocket it all comes out of the bottom line from the venue so i get paid based on what i bring so i don't have to worry about losing anymore which is phenomenal but i still get the opportunity to book my friends book the room you know it, it's just i retired mm-hmm. without retiring basically I, I don't have to i don't have that ad- additional stress of losing money we're yeah, worrying exactly. what if nobody comes to this show it's like well it's not going to happen now because now i got mainstream marketing behind me as well so mm-hmm. that's awesome congratulations yeah. on that so when you're booking like say a younger hardcore band kind of upcoming do a lot of these bands just do it all diy kind of like you did or are some bands coming with like some agent or does it happen both ways it's it's a mixture of everything you know it, you know take Madball for example they obviously they're at the next the next level and they have an agent but mm-hmm. you know what i get the phone call they're like hey we want to play what dates you got available okay i have this date that day okay we're going to revolve it around there this is what we need to get. We're just going to send the agent just to do the legwork. So basically I'm working it out with the band and the agent's just like, Hey, all right, I'm just firming up what the conversation was. So, and then I get a lot that are just like, Hey, you have a date coming through. We're we're really, we're, we had a show drop. A perfect example is um, that this band scowl. They're from uh, Northern California. The limp biscuit picked them up and put them on tour with them. Great band. Hardcore, and, and you know what? I, I got to give Limp Biscuit props for helping out bands of this genre. It's like nobody the, the, bands like that don't get breaks like this. Mm-hmm. They're they're playing in front of thousands of people. So now they reached out. They're like, "Oh, we have a day off." Like, all right, book it at the club. Boom, filled it. Gave them a guarantee. They rocked the place. You know, there's you know about a hundred kids there. They were happy. Everybody was happy. It's like so. I mean, I'm in the position now where I can help people. I can, you know, realistically make sure that these bands get take care of, taken care of. You know, nobody's going to screw them. They're not going to, you know, the venue is very open minded and very, even though it's kind of corporate, it's still DIY. Mm-hmm. When it comes to my shows, they just let me handle them. There's like, do what you got to do. That's oh, the best. And, yeah, that's a great deal. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and, and they, they trust me and, they, they know. And you know what? Yeah, there's been a couple of shows that have not done so well. But you know what? They still ponied up and gave these bands money. They're like, all right, we'll make it up on the next one. Fine. Yep. I'll tell you what. Ever since I partnered up, though, everything's been in the black. We've been very good with shows. So, 
Excellent, excellent. So I, I don't want to change the subject, but I see you have a giant CD collection behind I, you. I'm, I'm an old man, so I like having the, uh, <laughs> the collection. The is, product. It, is it alphabetized? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, uh, there's, there's another... There's another few boxes that are newer stuff I haven't mingled in yet. So. See, that's the problem is if you get a couple like a like a bunch of new records of CDs, you're like, okay, great, I gotta like switch every. No. I wait until I get about fifty CDs and then I do it. Yeah, yeah. A couple hours, but I'm like a weird OCD kind of person, so that shit kind of it's fun for me. Yeah. Me, but you know, but yeah, looking around here, I got. You know some. Uh, this, this is this is just my office here. Yes, hardcore posters everywhere. Yeah. Oh, it's like you know, got got the good old Slayer autographs, and we got Terror. You know, it's a whole bunch of stuff. So it's a little mixture of everything. But Love yeah, it. the CDs are definitely. I got vinyl, but a shit ton of vinyl too. So excellent. So, uh, so does, so brick by brick, do you guys, do you guys have any sort of schedule? Do you just keep putting out records or you just kind of go as you go? Cause it's more about like playing live shows and, and events. Yeah. We don't really have a, a formula per se. It's just basically what, you know, COVID pushed us into writing a new record because obviously right. it was working. We had time off and you know, I told the band, I said, we're, we're not going to be doing anything for a while. So let's write a new record series. And we sat on that thing for a year before we even released it. And then, um, we dove into our, our whiskey and, uh, alcohol, uh, collaborations. And we, you know, we had, what's, some... what's that like? What's that about? All right. So, um, I got, <laughs> beginning of COVID, I was bothering Jack Daniels. I was bugging him for an endorsement. I'm like, yo, I love Jack Daniels. What's going on? And, uh, it took a took a while, but finally I got through to a rep, and uh, he's like, "Well, um, I'm I'm a Tennessee Squire, which is a glorified Jack Daniels fan club, and um, <laughs> I collect a lot of bottles. I have a probably about a forty to fifty thousand dollar collection, all old bottles, rare bottles. So I register all the bottles through the distillery." So when I was talking to this rep, I told him that, and he researched my name in their system, and he, he emailed me back. He goes, oh, you're a real deal. Yeah, I said, yeah. I said, uh, so, yeah, what, what can we do? I want to I get some, uh, he goes, why don't we do a single barrel for you? We'll do a dedicated single barrel for brick by brick. And I'm like, really? I said, okay. So we did that. Um, it sold out in like three weeks. It, it, you know, We did, uh, I think, 245 bottles. And I uh, came in the barrel with the barrel. So we did that and it was successful. And then um, seeing that I have friends of mine that aren't touring, I, I, you know, I hit up Freddie from Madball. I said, hey, I said, I have a connection. You want to do a single barrel Jack Daniels? Yep. So I did one for Madball and that sold out in a couple weeks. Then I did one for Agnostic Front. And now we're at the tail end of COVID. So things are a little bit backed up. And it took 10 months for um, us to get the, the product from Jack Daniels, but it ended up coming through. So it took about six out of the 10 months to sell that out. And then what I did, my infinite wisdom, I said, you know what? We need to make a series. So we had Sheer Terror, Sick of It All, and Murphy's Law. I said, we got to do a barrel for them guys, too. They're the pioneers. You got to get these, you know, all the, keep it a New York hardcore series. So yeah. I, I hit up Jack Daniels and I ordered all three barrels at once thinking they were going to trickle in because it took 10 months for the agnostic front bottle. And then next thing you know, they called me like, all right, all three barrels are ready. You owe, <laughs> you, you owe us $53,000. I'm like, uh Oh, <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> so I, ended up, I ended up getting the money up and uh, I got them. So if anybody's out there and you want, you're interested in a sick of it all bottle of Jack, uh, of Jack Daniels, I got Murphy's Law and I got Sheer Terror. I'm about maybe 50% sold out on all three of those. Wow. Okay. How do you how do you oh. find the, how do you get those? Where do you get those? Um, you just just hit me up at mikevalenti1 at gmail.com. That's 
V A L E N T E. Oh, so you have to like literally email you because it's not in stores yet. Or uh, wow, it's, okay. It's kind of a a DIY kind of thing. Uh, you can't really just sell Jack Daniels anymore. Right. You have to have the <laughs> license and all that. You see, yeah, that's the thing. Is my band MXPX has done. Oh, that that's beautiful. That's uh, we've done beer collabs and through mail order as well, you know, because it's easier to just go to your, you know, where the brewery is and get the beer. But if, you, if you're out of state or something, you want to order it. Yeah. And, and there's that beer terror with the, it's got the medallion. Yeah. That looks beautiful. And uh, each bottle is etched. Cool. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. And then we do like a custom guitar pick in there too. But, but yeah, all the brick by brick, mad ball, and agnostic front ones are gone, and I, I'm about fifty percent of these, so eh, you know. But I, yeah, we did beer collabs too, and it, it's just it's so hard to make money on beer. It's yeah, you know, it's it, definitely it, more for marketing on our end, yeah, like it's, yeah, for a volume kind of thing. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna go out and sell stuff. I'm like, <laughs> let's just nah, let's we'll hold off. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's amazing that you 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 set that up and and you're including the community the hardcore scene yeah Yeah. it was my way of giving back you know and and and, you know especially when roger got his money for for the jack daniels that's at the time where he's he's i mean he's battling cancer and Mm -hmm. you know he's he's asking for help because the bills were just piling up i'm like yo i said i just your your bottle sold out you want me to send you he goes oh my god that would be so great so that's awesome yeah paid a bunch of bills for him that's great he is he doing well now right now he's doing better he I, we just saw him this past week and uh i saw agnostic front and sick with all a black and blue ball and he sounded phenomenal Excellent. and i asked him how he was doing he, he said he's better he's he's, he's getting there he's not 100 percent, but he's getting there cool good good to hear yeah he's been on the podcast a while back but it's been a it's been a little while yeah. super nice guy like you know, yeah. you think of Agnostic Front and how tough they are. <laughs> like you, you know, you're, you're a tough guy. Super nice. Uh, yeah, I love it. That's what's funny about the hardcore scene is looking in, all these people are, are obviously could kick your ass if they wanted to. But, you know, going to a Sick of It All show, I, it's so much love. There's just so much love. and I, I love that. Yeah, there's there's nothing to prove at these shows. It's like, well, there, there's only so many tough guy faces you can make. <laughs> you know, I'd rather... Well, remember back in the day, and maybe this still happens now and again, I remember like seeing stories or hearing stories about, you know, straight edge gangs coming to shows with box cutters and, and yeah. you know, ch- ch- cutting people up. And this is like the stories I'm hearing just as I'm getting into hardcore. I was at I was at an undertow show in Seattle where they were like a Seattle hardcore band and um, and and doing as well as, as anybody at the time. I felt like it was it was a huge show, but uh, that's what I was hearing. And. Was there, but I never saw it. So did you hear anything like that? Well, I mean, I know in like the eighties, uh, in the eighties, I mean, there were, there were, there were Nazi crews that used to come to shows. Mm-hmm. And they got forced right out. We just, we, I mean, especially in the Albany scene, it, it was rough in the early nineties. There was, you know, a lot of pit beef and fist fights and this one, that one. But I mean, and I, I have had my interactions with gangs coming to shows and all that and you know probably about four years ago we had a bike club motorcycle club come to one of the shows I'm like yeah uh, what's up guys you know or just and I, and I do the door mostly at my shows so i'm just like listen i said don't fuck around here i see they're like no 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 we're just here for a couple of days sure enough yeah <laughs> I, I was in it we had to wash up a bike club you know so here we are <laughs> now we're now we got a motorcycle club that don't like us and every time we see them you know whatever it's on but I don't, who cares <laughs> but <laughs> i mean i i don't stand for any of the bully bullshit at our shows you know it's like i know like some of the dancing gets really extreme and really rough and you know you got the crowd killing and all this stuff and i'm i mean my bouncers that i have at the shows are very experienced they know yeah, but nine times out of ten, you grab these kids, you drag them outside, you go, listen, either you guys are going to go without an audience behind that building, duke it out, or shake hands. And you know what? When you take that audience away, they shake hands. I promise you. And you know what? Next thing you know, they're drinking beers at the bar. It's like, you know, 
So, but that that's one thing we don't tolerate is, is the bully mentality because it's just it, it's slim pickings as it is. I mean, we're not mainstream. We're, there's like I said, there's not a lot of money in this scene. So stop. Got to protect it. Yeah. So let me ask you about festivals. Have you guys done any? I've seen a lot of hardcore festivals that are not. I'm not talking about giant music festivals like you yeah. know, but but just festivals that. There's a bunch of bands, maybe it's one or two days, and a, I get to like, oh, here's a band I've never heard of. Here's a band. I mean, it's just happening left and right when I when I check these out. Do you guys ever play any of these? Like, I think there's some in Philly. There's uh, There was just yeah. one in Tacoma, Washington. I wish I knew the names of them. I didn't do any research, sorry. But uh, have you played any or you know of any that are decent? And the thing is with us, I mean, I consider us a metal band mm -hmm. with a poor attitude. Um because, you know, we have more elements of thrash and metal and some parts of hardcore in our songs. So we're not a predominantly hardcore band. So usually when we play these festivals, a lot of kids don't know how to take us. They look at us. They're like, you know, you get the arms folded and they judge or they, they're sitting there listening. But when I see them nodding their heads and then once in a while, either a circle pit will break out or, or a full-on pit will break out. You know, I know we did good, but we always do good in merch. And a lot of the kids, they come up and they're like, oh, you guys are great. So um, we've played, like, Black and Blue Bowl. We've played um, Tough Love out in uh, – we it was in Riverside, California. We played there. We played um, – yeah, we played a bunch. You know, a lot of uh, festivals through Florida, the Carolinas. Um, we haven't done any festivals over in Europe yet. Uh, festival season was supposed to be during COVID, so we didn't mm -hmm. go. Um, so we're waiting to go back over to Europe. We had, well, we actually went on the festival tour. It was uh, the Rebellion tour with Madball, Death Before Dishonor, Iron Reagan, um, Born Born Pain, Born from Pain, um, Slope. Uh, who else was on that? And, uh, and uh, Ironed Out. So I mean, that was. That was fun. You know, we were on a tour bus for that. It was just, it was, it was a real, real good experience. But as far as like the festivals in front of like a hundred thousand people, we have not done that yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean that, yeah, that, that's a whole different kind of circuit for sure. For sure. But I just love that there's so many smaller festivals, you know, there's maybe it's like a couple thousand, a thousand people even. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, what else? I mean, like, where do you go from here? What do you guys got planned? Um, not even this summer, but just maybe in, in the next year or two. Well, right now we, we do have an East Coast tour planned for July. Uh, we got a couple of sporadic shows before that. Um, I stopped booking for the summer because well, our drummer just had a, a, a severe injury. He does. He tr he's a trainer for jujitsu mm -hmm. and. He didn't know that his MCL was torn off, basically. So he worked through it. He thought it was just, you know, oh, I'll work through it. I'll work through it. And he stood up and his knee bent backwards. Ooh. Ooh. Great. Have, uh, Jeff from Full Blown Chaos is filling in for all our summer stuff. So once summer's ended, we're going to see where Jameson uh, sits with uh, his injury. But he's probably leaning on retiring after this, which sucks. Yeah. Oh, but man, that is rough. Uh, I know um, our agent over in Europe is trying to get us a a, a five day run out in the UK for September. So I'm not sure if, what's going on with that yet. And like I said, a lot of things are just kind of up in the air right now. So we we got we got probably about 15 20 dates scheduled for the summer though. Awesome. Yeah, I just love just the the fact that like bands can be kind of i guess an easy way to describe them they could be companies or whatever but like you know you have your team maybe like a it's like a sports team you know you have your team yeah. and you have an injured player you got to get somebody to, to 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 fill in but it's uh it's unlike anything i've ever been a, i've never had like a i guess i've had one corporate job but it was already since i was i was uh i was already in a band for a long time so i guess i just don't i don't understand the real world as far as the corporate world yeah. and and but 
when it comes to music and bands and touring, that's that's the life I've been living. You know, that's it's everything. And so I think about like Europe and how, man, every time we go over there, it's just it's the same, but something changes, something's different. You know, same yeah. same thing here. You know, it's just every every three or three to five years, there's new companies, there's new bands, there's new people, and then of course you have the same old people or whatever, but. It's just a constant, like, okay, you have to, like, keep your head up yeah. and pay attention to where you're at, or else you just kind of, you might just get washed into a, a side, a side, I don't know, hole or whatever, but, um, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's wild out there, so it's a bummer that your, your drummer got hurt, but, yeah. uh, and, and he's somebody that you like to hang out with in the van, obviously. The guy's freaking hilarious i'm just like oh jesus <laughs> can you uh can you just convince him to just drive the van for the next <laughs> <year>? <laughs> just <to> laugh <laughs> yeah just for laughs like hey you don't have to load anything i mean it's hard to it's hard to yeah. give somebody that you know, I mean, he, he was supposed to have surgery today but he got covid mm. so they on that so that's i think that's postponed for a couple of weeks so i i just feel, i feel bad for him because it's just something that you really love doing and you know it's just uh, getting taken away right now it's just we, we already we had enough taken away with with the pandemic you know? yeah absolutely well jameson good vibes to you i hope you feel better i hope you get better recover well um you know it's the thing is like you might he might think he's going to retire but then like five years from now yeah it's like i feel pretty good i'm ready to go you know <laughs> i mean i i like to say this is this is life this isn't job this isn't career this is life, music, hardcore, punk rock for me, but uh, you know, it's it's what we're doing. So I'm gonna find a way to do whatever it is, it is I gotta do, yep. and so, you know, and I and I like that about what you've done. You know, you just you keep going, you roll with the punches. Now with COVID and everything, uh, it kind of seems like it's for the most part dying down, and yep. then I'm sure we're gonna have spikes of of things that happen. But how, uh, how, I don't know, how, how do you approach the shows you're booking? Is there a lot of bands that end up have, have been canceling over the year, like where you have to fill somebody in real quick? Is that a real thing? Like, what's the hardest part about it with, with the new world? I mean, in, in between November and January at the club, we definitely had a lot of cancellations and postponements, um, because of the COVID stuff, um. I'm seeing a lot less of that now, which is good. Good for us. I mean, well, we had to cancel a run of shows back in September because I got COVID. Um, but I mean, other than that, I mean, I, I, I think it's it's becoming. Le it's like anything. It's like you know, the the virus is slowly getting. I don't, I don't want to say like watered down, but it's slowly becoming less and less effective and. You know, more people are getting vaccinated. More, you know, more people are prepared for it. I guess so. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully, I don't want to say this year, but I'm hoping in maybe two years that it'll be either under control or a thing of the past. You know, and that's yeah. Uh, one can only hope. You know, I mean, like I said, it's what I did notice is it. I think it's going to screw up touring schedules i think a lot of lot more bands are going to tour less in the winter time and then more in the summer and what that's doing is it's creating an influx of and saturation of shows for the club mm -hmm. so it's like you have this is hardcore um happening in july so now they're they're a thursday through sunday event but you got bands coming in from California. So now I got bands hitting me up. Hey, we need this day because we're playing this day there. And then next thing you know, I got 15 bands wanting to play Albany, trying to make a three, four day run out of, out of the shows. And I'm just like, I'm like, listen, guys, you got to understand. I got, this is what I got booked. And that whole weekend is jammed for me, which is good. But I, it's just, it's kind of scary. It's like just such an influx of bands and, Everything's oversaturated right now, so I hope that calms down a little bit and spreads out a little bit more. But I, I don't think anybody's going to want to tour in the winter. That's what I. 
it's going to happen. You know, you know, the ironic thing about that is most people want to go to shows in the wintertime <laughs> because oh. it, it's cold out. Like, I don't want to be outside, so I want to go and see a show. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I found that our shows do better in the wintertime. Like, when we start in January, February, we do great. That's usually when we come to New York and we come to, you know, Chicago, all the all the coldest places for some reason. But I think it's because people are like, fuck it, I'm cold, I'm going to go inside and go see a show, rather than during summertime, nobody wants to go inside, it's already too hot. I agree. I mean, there's exceptions to that, but... we Our past two records, we did our release parties in February, mm-hmm. and numbers are through the roof. Mm-hmm. You know, I, we just played uh, February 19th, we released Dismal Existence, and we played with uh, uh, Nuclear Assault, uh, we had Skinless on the bill, and Ringworm. And we had over 750 people at that show. It was phenomenal. It was a great time. It was just so much fun. The only thing you got to worry about is if it's going to snow, but mm-hmm. you know, that, that's with anything. But Yeah, you know. I always worry about that if we're flying out somewhere during the wintertime. I know the show's going to be good if we can just actually get there. You know? yep. <laughs> so, that's the problem. Bands do not, and I, I'm right there with everybody. I don't like to play during the wintertime. I'd rather play during the summer. <laughs> but, you know... Got to go where the people, the people yep. are. Um, but yeah, you're right. Summer is maybe that's also why you know it's harder to tour during the summer is just because it's so there's so many bands already touring. The festivals I always found the festivals you know go for the festivals. We spent a lot of years doing bands warp tour you know during the summertime and um, that seems to be kind of different nowadays. There's there isn't like a bunch of touring touring shows that happen in the rock scene in the punk scene in the hardcore scene or whatever um like there used to be and i'm sure it'll come back um Lollapalooza was sort of like the big dog for for a long time you know early 90s but um yeah i think i don't know i i get annoyed about seeing like seeing like big festivals and and how hyped up it is but at the same time it's like i i get that it's fun i get that people want to go to events and this and that um but i personally just love going to see my favorite band with a couple of other bands that are yep. similar like i just love going to shows and and now and again i can put up with a festival but shows i can really focus on the music i can really focus in on what's happening the, the best part about the club that I got to is the downstairs is a 350 cap. So the bands, uh, like I just had a bituary there and it's just such a, it's such an intimate experience. You know, it's like, that's a band that usually plays bigger stuff and mm-hmm. just there with a packed 350 person room. It's just, I don't know. To me, that is just mind blowing for me. And I, that's what I like to see. I love seeing that, you know? Absolutely. And it's so cool that you have a room, like 350 cap rooms aren't, there's not that many of them in the, in the U.S. Um, it's, you know, in 350, 500, 600, like those are very hard to come by, like good venues yeah. that have that, that amount of people. So uh, hold on to that, man. It's like, you know, anytime I think about the heyday of either Kitsap County scene where I grew up, uh, Bremerton, Washington, where, where I grew up, um, we had certain venues that are just gone now, you know, and, and, and that's that's the way it happens. And things come and go. Even the best things don't last. Um, so just appreciate that. Anybody listening, that if you're if you have a venue you love, just go to as many shows as you possibly can. Because someday you'll be like, yeah, remember when we used to go shows there? Yeah, it's a real thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you gotta you gotta support because uh, it ain't cheap keeping these venues running either. It's right. Not- It is not cheap. You know, I mean, we're we're contending with, you know, probably a $25,000 overhead every month at this club. You know, we got two venues. So, you know, I mean, you you figure it's just, it's $11,000 just for the lease. And then you got payroll and you got insurance, you got liquor license stuff. So, I mean, people got to understand that there's a reason why tickets are the way they are. And you know what? And I'm, I am I still do $10 shows. Mm-hmm. Everybody, oh, it's got to be a $20 show. I'm like, no, oh, it doesn't need to be a $20 show. Make it a $10 show. It's like, 
I mean, the club, that's like I said, the club doesn't argue. They don't care because their bread and butter is the bar. So mm -hmm. they, if it's a free show, they don't care as long as people are drinking there. You right. Know? And the more people there, the more people are going to drink by default. That's simple. Yep. I that's mean, it. everybody out there, just support the venue, support the bands, buy their merch. Yeah. You know, Dude. That, I, I love your attitude. I love what you got going on. Um, I'm going to keep paying attention. What What else you want to tell people before we get wrapped up? Uh, well, like I said, we're doing East Coast tours. So anybody on the East Coast, we're, we're hitting that hard starting in July. Um, got our new record, Dismal Existence, on Upstate Records. Um, they, they got all sorts of stuff. They got different colored vinyl for sale. Uh, they got CDs. They got the digital downloads. They got everything on there. Um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, I think we talked about pretty much everything else. And yeah. we just gonna get back over to Europe, you know? Excellent, excellent. Yeah, um, hard. it's a brick-by-brick brick hardcore on Instagram. Yep. And the website, just probably brick, brick by brick dot com, uh, or maybe not. <laughs> you don't know. Enough. I mean, I, I pretty much answer everything on there. Okay. Uh, I get bombarded by a bunch of stuff sometimes, but you know, I, I sift through everything. I'm like I said, I'm OCD, so I can't have that little icon with the numbers. You got forty two messages. All right, I got to answer them all. <laughs> you don't want to see my inbox, my email. It's like thou like fifty thousand emails or something. <laughs> of course, half of them are junk mail, most of them. But <laughs> that would drive you crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's about it. I mean, just uh, in, in this uh, East Coast tour, we're bringing uh, Cutthroat from LA out with us. The great guys, hard working band too, and. Uh, yeah, and uh, we're doing our tour kickoff party at locally at, at Empire. So we got Cutthroat on there. We're bringing Powerhouse from San Francisco. They're on the bill. They're it's a a one off uh, from the This Is Hardcore Fest that they're doing. So I mean, check Empire Live and Empire Underground too. I mean, we got everybody from Crowbar to Guar to Madball coming through there. So. Awesome. This is in Albany, New York. Oh, Albany, New York. Yeah. And then when's the date for your uh, ours? Show? Uh, our tour starts July eighth. Okay. So uh, Albany show, and then we we go to Fredericksburg, Maryland. Then we do the Carolinas. We hit Florida, uh, Georgia, and then we're coming back up. We're, I think we hit DC and and Philly on the way back. So. It'll be a good run. It'll Excellent. Be fun. Yeah, hot girl summer coming up. <laughs> awesome. Uh, everybody, uh, shout out to Mike Valente, Brick by Brick Hardcore. I uh, appreciate your time, man. Appreciate you having me. It really means a lot. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome.